Okay, it looks like we're, we're, we're recording. So I want to share a few thoughts with you about the chapter that covers virtue ethics. And to begin with, let me observe that as an academic writer myself, I'm a bit surprised at some at uh, the way that the authors of our textbook have organized the material. Um, the three major schools that they've addressed so far are consequentialist, deontological, and now virtue ethics. But here's the thing that strikes me as a bit odd. Historically, virtue ethics is the first major school of ethics. Deontological or conscient ethics didn't come along until the uh, early to mid 1700s. Consequentialist or utilitarian ethics came to its prime in the 1800s. So ironically, our authors have worked chronologically backwards. Now, that being said, let me raise uh, some interesting points that strike me when I'm reading this chapter. But before I do that, let me see if I can open up my PowerPoint. Ah, here we go. So now, one thing that I find very striking when we read about Aristotle and Confucius is that their understanding is not, is not compatible with usually our default understanding of human nature in the West, specifically the concept of original sin. Oh, wait, sorry. Now if that original sin, really cheesy movie, if I might say so. No, this one. So now it bears, I think, underlining that for both Aristotle and Confucius, the tacit assumption is that humans have an innate capacity for goodness. However, this innate capacity has to be cultivated and developed. I would add that in Judaism, there's a similar presupposition that everyone, according to rabbis that I've spoken with, uh, the learned rabbis tell me that all human beings are created with equal capacities for good and for evil. And it's by our choices that we make that we indicate and develop which one becomes preeminent in our being. So the notion in all three of these traditions may be provocative to those who go on the tacit assumption that human nature is basically evil. I am here to tell you, many, maybe even most world religions do not have that presupposition. Now, there's an important um, implication for that in terms of relational individuality. As observed in our text, moral consideration in all human relationships is a cardinal consideration in Confucian societies. I've linked in the uh, print version of this announcement, a video on the theme of consideration for others, which shows very many examples of how in Asia, the default is that you think about your relationships with other people to be considerate of others in ways that, you know, in the West, we probably would never think of. Um, it's probably not surprising as a result that from what I've read before the, the development of the vaccine, Asian countries were doing far better than Western countries in containing the spread because in many Asian countries, it's already common practice for people to wear masks when they go out if they have any faintest suspicion that they might have a cold or flu. This is a matter of consideration for others. They don't want to risk possibly infecting someone else. Let me add a couple small corrections I think are worth sharing about how our authors talk about Confucianism. Although they do mention the value of Shu or reciprocity, I think they've omitted how this applies to the five relationships. Although according to Confucius, there are five cardinal relationships in which one part always outranks the other with corresponding differences in duties, there's also reciprocity in these relationships. So for example, as I've mentioned before, the emperor, according to Confucius, had a duty to be beneficent to his subjects and his subjects had a duty to be loyal to the emperor. But if the emperor failed to be beneficent to that extent, 
the Son Dukes did not have a duty of loyalty to the emperor. Um, similarly, and whenever I share this in class, I always find that some of our, my uh, female students get a little bit of perturbed. Traditionally, according to Confucius, a wife has a duty to obey her husband. But here's the thing, that is conditional. The husband is, has a duty to take the time to listen to his wife and to be himself righteous. If a husband fails consistently to listen to his wife, if the husband fails to be a righteous person, then to that extent, his wife's duty of obedience fades away. Let me also add that our authors state that friendship is a reciprocal relationship of respect among equals. It's the only carnal relationship that is not hierarchical. But you know what? I've seen two different versions of this. Some scholars say that it's non-hierarchical, but there's a default in Confucianism that um, you um, interact with people on three criteria. Uh, status, age, and gender. So a higher status person has more status than a lower status person. A older person has more status than a younger person. And yes, I'm sorry, it was from 500 BCE. Males had higher status than females. But that said, a low status male had to defer to a high status woman and quid pro quo. Here's the thing. Some scholars believe that there is a similar reciprocity, but also hierarchy in the relationship of friend to friend, that an older friend has a duty to be considerate of his juniors, but a younger friends have a duty to, to defer to their older friend. Let me give you an example. Let's say, for example, that I got together with a good bunch of my good buddies. Here are some people that I got together with uh, for a July 4th barbecue, for example. Well, if I just got together with my buddies here, you'll note that I'm probably the oldest looking and greatest person in this photo. Well, since most of my buddies are younger than I am, according to Confucius, I would have a right to expect them to defer to my judgment. Um, say, for example, we're going out to a restaurant, they would be expected to defer to my preference. But here's the thing, I would also have a duty to be considerate if I knew, for example, that um, someone loathed pizza, although how can you loathe pizza, or have, let us say, gluten sensitivity, I should be considerate of that person's needs and not insist on going to two saucy broads, pizza and beer parlor. Much so I love it. So let's talk, uh, the, let me share some miscellaneous observations about Confucianism. So uh, the authors are correct to describe Li as the notion of ritual for propriety. And that is incredibly important in Confucian societies. Now, I must admit, I've never myself had the opportunity to visit, visit Asia, but from what I've read and have gathered from people I've talked to who have traveled to Asia, it almost seems like there's a ritual for almost everything. And it's important to honor and respect these rituals. Say, for example, something even as seemingly minor as how to exchange business cards. There's a, almost a ritual for almost everything. And it's important to know what the ritual is and observe it punctiliously. Now, given our tendency towards atomistic individuality in the West, some Westerners find this ritualism a bit off-putting, but I think it does serve a purpose for underlining our mutual humanity. Consider who would be more likely to remember, who would you be more likely to remember subsequently? Someone who just casually tossed their business card at you or someone who went through this ritual of carefully presenting their business card to you while making eye contact. And then of course you're expected to take the business card 
make eye contact with the person offering and make some positive comment about the card. And then you have to have a business card holder and you have to engage in the ritual of respectfully putting it in your business card holder. In which case you're more likely to remember the other person. Another important concept is the notion of filial piety, sometimes called Xiao. It's a cardinal virtue and it is explicitly called out in the movie from just a few years ago called Crazy Rich Asians. In the print version of this uh, announcement, I've linked a clip where the protagonist is talking with her good girlfriend and uh, played by the wondrous Aquafina. And they specifically talk about the importance of filial piety. If you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend it. But you know what? I think there's a lot more to be gotten out of this movie if you first know something about Confucianism, because so much of the interpersonal uh, interactions and politics in this movie are premised on Confucian, con the Confucian relationships. Incidentally, there I go again, making another pop culture reference. Don't tell the other pots. Now, the essential notion in virtue ethics is that you attain virtue by consciously cultivating virtuous behavior on the theory that you will eventually internalize this and the virtuous behavior will become spontaneous and natural for you. Now, one thing that I find interesting about that is that it's very much compatible with the classical theory of acting. Uh, especially uh, with actors from Great Britain. British actors are taught to carefully observe the body language of people in a given emotional state and imitate the body language and expression on the theory that if you do so punctiliously, the proper emotion will eventually spontaneously emerge. If you want to play a character who's in mourning, you go to funerals and you watch the way people carry themselves at a funeral and you imitate that language and lo and behold, you start feeling the emotion. Whereas most American actors are taught what's called method acting, where you first tap into what's called an affective memory. You summon up a memory that has strong emotion associated with it. And the expectation is that you, if you really deeply, sincerely feel that emotion, your body language your expression, your tone of voice will radiate from that. Our friends from across the pond work from the outside in. And in much of the way that most of the Confucians and as per our text, Benjamin Franklin apparently did by purposely, consciously cultivating uh, various virtues on a regular day in day out basis. An interesting example of the distinction between method acting and classical acting, by the way, I have to share this classical story. When um, Dustin Hoffman, a method actor, was in a thriller called Marathon Man with um, Sir Lawrence Olivier, there was a scene where his character was supposed to have been kept slumpless for three days. So leading up to the scene, Douglas Hoffman decided not to sleep for three days. Well, when um, Sir Lawrence Olivier was confronted with that, his first response was, dear boy, why not try acting? It's so much easier. A couple final observations about virtue ethics. Our authors question whether the tendency to be moral is naturally implanted in human beings. Uh, they seem to be a bit dubious about this. But many psychological experiments have established that even social animals are capable of empathy. And I've read some scientific speculation that humans have become the most dominant species uh, in this planet, precisely because of our outsized capacity to form empathic bonds for others. Think of it this way. Most animals um, will belong to our familial units or tribes, social animals, I mean, or packs. But what animal establishes city states or states or nation states or multi 
multilateral international agreements only human beings because we are able to bond or connect with other people. Maybe empathy is an innate part of what makes us human. After all, it's found in other social animals and the more intelligent the social animal is, largely, usually the larger the social unit it is to which they belong. One final pop cultural observation. Yes, I'm risking getting called out by my fellow professors. Um, let me ask you this. Do you enjoy the Marvel superhero movies? Particularly, let's say, for example, the Avengers franchise. Well, at the risk of a little dad humor here, let me float an idea by you. Can we, in part, understand these movies as disquisitions on virtue ethics? Uh, what's that, Kitty? Oh, my, my cat here believes that we should consider them that way, but she's been influenced by me, right, Kitty? Um, so, for example, Captain America, Tony Stark, Stephen Strange. I've seen all of these movies. I quite enjoyed them. They are all portrayed as heroes, but each of them are heroes in a very different way, are they not? Captain America is not a great genius, but he is um, a devout patriot to his understanding of what it means to be American. Tony Stark is a bit arrogant, but he's also brilliant. If anything, Dr. Strange is even more brilliant because he's learned this difficult technology in the movie for directly uh, affecting the physical world by his intent and his words and his gestures. Hence, basically magic. They are all portrayed as heroes, but each of them is are heroic in very different ways, are they not? Just as cop movies or TV, cop TV shows often run on a tacit tension between duty and consequentialist ethics, can we not see a similar tension between different conceptions of virtue ethics in superhero movies? Maybe we can understand what's going on in these movies as different versions as to or different understandings of what it is that makes someone a hero. Or is that a reach on my part? So what do you think? How do you think your moral and ethical viewpoint would differ if you operated on the assumption that human nature is essentially good or if you operated on the assumption that human nature is essentially evil. How would that impact your morality or more to the point, your ethics? Well, that's my thought on, thoughts on the chapter about virtue ethics. Uh, as time permits, I hope either tomorrow or the day after, I will uh, record some observations about the other chapter that was assigned uh, this week about predestination and maybe some comments about Roger Dawkins' essay about whether or not we can legitimately blame people for their social, for their ethical choices. There's my thoughts. Have a good evening. Ciao for now.